grace, peace, and mercy to you. Amen. Take a journey with me back in time. I was a sophomore at Concordia University, Wisconsin. Although it was many years ago, I remember like it was yesterday. You see, it was my best year of college. It was the year I met Rebecca. Well, that was the icing on the cake. The cake was the life God blessed me with that year. Besides all that academic stuff I had to do, I had fun every single day. I lived in the dorm, the Peace Center. Those who lived in the PC were unique individuals, as we were the only students that had to go outside every day to get to class or to eat. The rest of CUW is connected by halls and tunnels. And although Wittenberg was known for as the jock dorm, PC was where it was at. We would have nightly devotions and discussion, followed by the greatest card game ever, Euchre. It was during my sophomore year that my Euchre partner and roommate, who was also a graduate of St. Matthew, Brian Horvath, that he and I only lost once throughout the entire year. To this day, we still think there was something fishy about that loss. <laughs> If you have never played Euchre, it's an easy game to learn, but a hard game to master. To be competitive, you need to know how your partner plays and thinks. You need to be able to read their minds when they play a card in a certain way. You read body language and always play in a supportive role if your partner calls it up. One of the many quotes that Brian would say during any Euchre game would be, when you got to shoot, shoot, don't talk. The problem with Euchre is many times people want to table talk to give their partners hints on what cards they have in their hands. Maybe it's talking about buying an engagement ring because you have all the diamonds, or being lucky if you have clubs. Let me tell you, this time I had to dig a ditch, I got spades. Or maybe you are humming and swaying trying to decide what to play. So you take your time to play a card. Just play it. Stop talking about it. Play it. Last week, we were excited. And we talked about being excited for Christ. Being excited for being a member of St. Matthew. Now, let me say, I was a little surprised when the senior room wasn't overflowing on Tuesday. Maybe I need to reread that part of the message from last week. Tuesdays at 9.30 a.m. in the senior room or on Facebook as we broadcast it live. So we are excited, right? Now what? Is that it? Yay! We are excited. Our battles won't be so bad. Our gloom and depression won't be so hard. And people will be attracted to us. What are we going to do about it? Are you going to be a passive Christian or an active Christian? A small child sitting in church asked his father, Dad, what is a Christian? The father replied, A Christian is a person who loves and obeys God. He loves his friends and neighbors and even his enemies. He prays often, is kind, gentle, and holy, and is more interested in going to heaven than in all earthly riches. That son is a Christian. The boy looked puzzled and thought for a minute. Then he asked, Have I ever seen one? If we're going to be authentic and relevant, we must embrace truth and allow it to transform us at our very core. So let's take a look at three ways to act like you know you've been changed. When you act like you've been changed, or you know you've been changed, you'll change your posture. Acts 3, 8. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. The lame man went from being crippled to standing upright. How many of us know that we have been changed by the Lord? Raise your hands if you know you've been changed by the Lord. Now, you don't need to raise your hand on this question, but how many of you that had your hands raised still come into church with the same old dry praise, moping, frowning, and head hang low, complaining about something? 
Picture you are at the doctor's office waiting to hear the results of your test, and your do doctor walks in with their head down and a frown on their face. Would you feel excited or feel like bad news was coming your way? When you act like you know you've been changed, your posture will change. You'll come into the house of God with your head held high no matter what you're facing. And every time you experience God making a change in your life, you'll have a new shout, a new run, a new holler, something. I was listening to a podcast about a runner who was running in a last man standing race. To explain, you have about a four mile course that you run. If you finish that four miles within an hour, you advance to the next lap. Every top of the hour, the horn sounds and off you go. If you take more than an hour, you are eliminated. This continues until there's only one left. Last October at one of these types of races, Courtney DeWalter, one of the top elite women ultra runners, completed 67 laps in the 67 hours allotted. This was good enough for second place. For Johan Steen, finished 68 laps for first. The podcast went on talking about posture. And when someone asks you, how are you doing? The speaker knew that a runner would only have one to two laps left in them by the way they look with their heads down or how they responded to that question doing horrible when you act like you know you've been changed you don't have to wait for other people to do for you what you can do for yourself acts 3 2 now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gates called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for, from those going into the temple courts. Before the lame man experienced a change, he had to rely on others to carry him where he needed to go. Now going back to Acts 3.8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple court, walking and jumping and praising God. When he got his change, though, he automatically was able to push himself to a place of praise and worship in God. When you really know you've been changed, you don't have to wait for nobody else to push you to a mindset of praise and worship in God. You don't have to wait for the preacher, ministers, choir, praise team, musicians, or nobody to push and provoke you to praise. You'll come in busting the door down with praise because you know you've been changed. When you act like you know you've been changed, you don't allow your location or those around you to control whether you act like you know or not. Acts 3, verses 8 through 9. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God. So, did you notice that the man didn't wait until he got outside to praise and worship God? But he started doing it at the temple gates. Too many of us that say we know we've been changed only act like it in the house of God. If that. When you know you've been changed, you don't have to wait until you get into the house of God to give him praise. But you'll bust loose with a praise anywhere. During the National Youth Gathering, I read a story that touched my heart, and I hope it will touch yours also. As there were 20,000 plus youths and adults in Minneapolis, it could be hard to find time to eat that was fast and or cheap. At one of the local five guys in the area, it was filled with different youth groups. All of the teenagers that were there were tired and hungry and waiting for their food. Now, if we get a hot and ready pizza and it's not hot and ready when we're pulled through the drive-thru, we throw a fit. But not at this five guys burger joint. People waited. And then one individual took the counter tip jar and went from table to table, youth to adult, and they filled the tip jar in more. What a witness to the workers that here is a large group of teenagers that are showing their appreciation for the hard work they were doing. The layman wasn't concerned about who was around him while he praised God. When you act like you know you've been changed, you ain't worried about those around you 
who's watching you, talking about you, etc. You just give God glory. What are you going to do? How are we going to show the world that we are Christians and we have this excitement and we want others to be excited as well and partake in the glory of the grace of God? Isn't it so easy to sit here in the pew each week, hear the message, get pumped up, get excited, get into our cars, go home, and forget everything we were so pumped up to do? It is like when teachers or principals go to conferences, you learn all these great new techniques and procedures, and you are so ready to implement them in the classroom or school, and Monday comes around, and you fall right back into your old routine. Stop it. We are supposed to be transformed into the image of Jesus. If we do not respond and act, and accept the transforming grace of God when we are just like the Pharisees. Jesus described in Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Listen to the words of Brennan Manning during a discussion he had with DC Talk back in the early 90s. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out their doors and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. What are we going to do? How do we live a Christ-like life when we know we are sinners? We know we will stumble and fall. Penn Jillette, half of the comedic duo Penn and Teller, is an outspoken atheist. With that said, he recounted a time when one of his participants from one of their shows came up to him and gave him a Bible. Listen to what Penn, an atheist, had to say about this guy and about being Christians as a whole. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, but that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible. How much do you have to hate somebody to not tell them about the grace of God? I don't have all the answers. I stand before you as much as a failure as anyone else. I have the same fears. If I speak up, what will others say? What will they call me? Shame on me. 
It is truly amazing when you do speak up, though. You may even be surprised. A few years ago, I would run at a weekly run group in Canton. And last week, I mentioned my friend Eric, who was an elite runner. He would lead this group run from the running store he worked at on the side. The more you go, the more you get to know about the people. Besides coaching at Lawrence Tech, he was also at the time coaching track at a Catholic high school in Pontiac. His co-worker, turns out, she was Catholic too. Then one week, I overheard another runner who was there many times say she was a Lutheran. So I got to talking and asked her the most important question, LCMS, Elka, or Wisconsin Synod? She said LCMS, and I'm thinking, wow, that's cool. And it turns out she is a member at Christ Our Savior, and she is a teacher in the Livonia Public School District. It is one thing about how small the Lutheran world is when you are within your own church walls, but it is even more amazing when you know you are not alone out there. Now, there are so many other excuses why we don't speak up. One of the most common responses is, I don't know what to say or how to respond to someone. You know who else had that same issue? Moses. In Exodus 4.10, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And you know what God said back in verse 11 and 12? The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or make them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. And then Moses had the audacity to speak back. Moses was like, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Here is Moses speaking to the Lord. And the Lord told him to do something. And he was like, nah, send someone else. Picture what would have happened if you told your mom or dad, nah, let someone else do what you just told me to do. I know what would have happened to me if I told my dad that. Verse 14 shows that the Lord was angered by Moses, but he already had a master plan in place. What about your brother Aaron? He is already on his way to meet you. I will help both of you. I will give you the words to say. He can speak for you. God has it under control. God will give you the words you need to reach the loss. As you leave church today, I want you to take a good look at the stained glass window in the back. It's a window that is broken into three main panes. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And written on it is the Great Commission. Go, baptize, teach. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.